This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. There's no price of admission for this show, but it is Memorial Day, so overcooked dogs and your favorite beverages are encouraged, like this. I just needed an excuse to show that one off again. We're starting today with our focus on veterans. At some point this year, America's longest war will come to an end. President Biden has laid out a September 11th deadline for pulling US troops out of Afghanistan, and the Pentagon wants that to happen even sooner. The war in Afghanistan has lasted two decades and claimed the lives of more than 2,300 servicemen and women. But the human cost of war doesn't end when the troops are pulled out. Some of them will inevitably bring the war home with them. During the Civil War, it was called Soldier's Heart. World War I, it was shell shock. World War II, battle fatigue or combat stress reaction. Eventually, after researching Vietnam veterans, Holocaust survivors, and sexual assault victims, psychologists finally found a language to describe what plagued people who lived through trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Estimates for cases of PTSD among veterans vary widely, but one major study of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans found that nearly 14% of respondents were positively screened for PTSD. Some troops coming back from the war in Afghanistan will struggle with mental health issues and adjusting to life back at home. Many have or still are. Those struggles and the care required to deal with them are something to keep in mind even as the war becomes history. The first thing when I heard about Afghanistan war being uh, ended and troops coming home was there's going to be more suicides from veterans. And that means for us, there's going to be more veteran families thrown into absolute chaos and despair from this suicide. Dave Barbush is the CEO for Once a Soldier, a postvention organization that helps the families of veterans who have committed suicide. We should note that not every veteran diagnosed with PTSD is suicidal, and not every suicide among veterans is directly related to PTSD. But the mental health disorder is one of the drivers of veteran suicide something that claims the lives of more than 17 veterans a day, and the number of younger veterans who know somebody who has committed suicide or thought about taking their own life has increased over the last few years. Suicide feeds upon itself a lot of times. There's a lot of suicide ideation because the troops are very much in, in communication with each other and they know what happens to this guy or that guy who maybe they haven't seen in a while. I'm not gonna lie, that's a pretty grim picture of the battles veterans are fighting when they get back home. But there is good news. There's a lower rate of suicides among veterans who use services provided by the Veterans Health Administration. There's increased data collection of societal factors related to suicides. And because there's no one solution, there are myriad ways for veterans or their friends or families to seek help like this. If you haven't heard, ITL has turned one. That's right, a year older. Wiser, eh, jury's still out. When you're back, we'll take a moment to show you some of our favorite stories from the past year. This is your cue to head to the cooler. So this show got started on Memorial Day 2020, about a year ago. Tonight, we wanna go back and revisit some of our favorite stories we've brought to you on In The Loop. This past year has seen a lot more folks looking at issues of race and justice with a new lens. And it's also seen a lot of folks picking up virtual game nights. You might be asking yourself, how are these things related exactly? Our Next Level series showed how some folks are rethinking fantasy tropes and the beloved Dungeons & Dragons game for a new era. Here's Newsies Matt Picked with one of our favorite stories of the past year. Dracarys. Fantasy stories can be a fun bit of escapism, and everyone can use a nice break from reality now and again. Especially now. But even the most out there fiction and fantasy role-playing still has to reckon with its real-world baggage from time to time. And one such reckoning is underway for the popular tabletop game Dungeons & Dragons. When I'm playing these games and when I'm telling these stories, I want myself and the people I'm playing with to have a good time. And if any aspect of it is making that harder for someone or for multiples of us, then we sit and we figure it out. Gabriel Hicks is a game designer, voice actor, and cosplayer who's worked on a number of tabletop games, including some D&D game books, and he's gained a dedicated following for his work. He's also one of the many people who've been playing Dungeons and Dragons over the internet in this quarantine era. When you analyze, you do this. <laughs> 
Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. The iconic tabletop role-playing game has exploded in popularity over the past couple of years, thanks to a more accessible version of the game and the rise of high-profile D&D podcasts Abandon all hope, ye who enter the adventure zone and streaming shows. Welcome to Critical Role, where a bunch of us nerdy-ass voice actors sit around and play Dungeons and Dragons. The game's renaissance spiked even more after COVID-19 hit. Virtual D&D services have reported massive growth in users over the past few months. But amid waves of demonstrations calling for racial justice across America, D&D's parent company, Wizards of the Coast, admitted their game has its flaws in how it handles race. Flaws that date back to the game's origins in the 70s. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really just something that people were used to because in as we get older and smarter and learn more, we discover we use things that are archaic ideologies or terms. The topic of race comes up surprisingly often in these tabletop games. One of the few things D&D players do when starting a game is to pick what kind of character they want to be, an elf, a dwarf, a human, etc. The game refers to this process as choosing your quote race. The game's mechanics attach physical traits to each race. For example, all orc characters tend to start out stronger and dumber than their human counterparts. Those distinctions obviously don't perfectly line up with a real-world concept of race, but the idea that certain kinds of sentient beings are naturally stronger or smarter than other types is still a troubling one for many people. I don't like that we are bound to those stereotypes, to be honest. If there is an orc wizard who has spent the first three lives as a wizard, literally just reading and learning and understanding. It would make sense if they're smarter rather than stronger. A few months back, Hicks released his own unofficial module for D&D, which ties a character's physical attributes to their job rather than their race. For Hicks, the module helps players explore characters that are less hemmed in by their fantasy species. There was a bunch of people who said, well, Gabe, it doesn't make sense because they're an orc or they're a minotaur, so they have to be stronger. And it's not a good argument because this is a world where there's a canonical magical jar that can make gallons of mayonnaise. Anything can be possible. Hicks isn't alone in this pursuit. Other D&D players and designers have stepped up to try and address how the game handles race. Game producer Eugene Marshall crowdfunded his Ancestry and Culture book on Kickstarter with the explicit goal of rethinking race in D&D. Uh, how do I remove that unpleasant part, but still make it feel both like D&D, and also I want it to be something that anybody can just pick up and use without any trouble. Marshall says D&D's default approach echoes the real-world concept of racial essentialism, the discredited idea that racial groups are defined by unique biological or genetic differences rather than by social values. Nowadays, the only people that really believe this are, well, people that either don't realize what they're saying, they aren't educated on the issue, or they're people that are quite intentionally doing it, and they're using it as a racist ideology. Issues of race run throughout fantasy stories as a whole. Author J.R.R. Tolkien's infamous description of orcs as the, quote, least lovely Mongol types has continued to haunt the genre. And regardless of any actual malice on the author's part, it's true that fantasy stories typically derive from a time with a much different understanding of race. They present certain ideas, and we don't tend to be very um, actively thinking about what ideas we get from popular culture. You know, we consume it as entertainment, so we're not looking for what political positions we're getting from our popular culture. Helen Young is a literature professor at Australia's Deakin University and the author of a book examining racial analogues in fantasy literature. In the reality we live in, race is a social construct. There's no kind of genetic evidence for it existing. But in fantasy worlds, there is, right? So they're, they're really literally racist fantasies. And that can enable bad actors to exploit those narratives. White supremacist website Stormfront infamously maintained a section on the Lord of the Rings movies for a time. When the movies came out, I got super into it and I figured you could probably get people who like such a super white mythos. A few of them are probably going to be turned on by white nationalism. Mm. Dungeons and Dragons didn't create those trends, of course, and it's not solely responsible for ending them. But as more and more people flock to the game, it's facing an increasing need to expand its storytelling to fit its audience. I love this game, but no person or corporation in general is infallible. Mm. Um, 
and you want to hope for the best, but you also still have a personal right to want to hold people accountable. You know, it was this story that kind of got me into D&D. Yeah, I actually started playing during this pandemic and why not? You can be anything, including a grumpy half-orc with a military past who created a sea shanty and is learning to love. I'm not kidding. No doubt one of the biggest stories we covered on In The Loop was January's attack on the US Capitol. People who watched this play out in real time remember rioters with weapons and zip ties stomping through the halls of Congress. But it took a closer look at dozens of hours of live streams and social posts to show just how far the rioters got and what sort of sensitive info they might have gotten their hands on. Jake Godin of our award-winning Newsy Bellingcat series dug through the evidence for a visual investigation of a dark day for democracy. Get that crap! Questions remain around the storming of the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. How did a violent mob so easily infiltrate the building? What was the extent of their tear through the Capitol? And what are the national security implications of hundreds of compromised computers and offices in Congress? Using photos and footage from the chaos as it unfolded, open source research can give us a clearer picture and get us closer to answers. Stop the steal! Stop the steal! Stop the steal! The riot began as a rally protesting the results of the presidential election, attended by the president himself. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. But as the president was speaking on the National Mall, protests at the Capitol were already growing riotous. USA! USA! At around 2 p.m. Eastern time, protesters stormed the Capitol building, scaling walls, smashing windows, and tearing down barricades. The rioters met only limited resistance from a heavily outnumbered police presence. The buildup of Trump supporters took place mainly at two locations surrounding the Capitol building, at the west entrance and on the east entrance. Both sides had large groups of supporters pushing back against a thin police presence. As protesters on the west side circumvented the police line blocking the front entrance, other police just sat and watched as they streamed into the Capitol's Senate wing through a shattered window and doorways. On the east side of the Capitol, a large buildup of Trump supporters swarmed the police line and eventually forced the police to retreat back towards the Capitol steps. Wow, they made it, dude! They then made their way to the central entrance where they attempted to get into the building. The sparse police presence inside the Capitol was overwhelmed. Baked Alaska, a neo-Nazi activist, was streaming video as he entered an office on the building's ground floor. Hey, whose office is this? Let's call Trump, yes! Can I can call the U.S. Senate, apparently. Turns out it was Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley's hideaway office. He posted a video of the ransacked room later in the evening. You can see the debris all over the floor. One of the more grim incidents of the night occurred here right outside the doors of the speaker's lobby near the House chamber where members of Congress were evacuating. Packing the hallway, Trump supporters ran up against Capitol Police, blocking the door to the speaker's lobby. As more police arrived, the ones guarding the door left, giving the Trump supporters a chance to break the windows leading into the lobby. A clock visible above the lobby doors shows that the time was approximately 2.44 p.m. Two minutes later, a woman, later identified as Ashley Babbitt, attempts to climb through the window and is shot by a guard on the other side. The area she was entering would have provided access to the house chamber, where other images from the night showed guards pointing guns at Trump supporters trying to break into the barricaded front door. During the breach, rioters had unprecedented access to confidential documents. A now-deleted photo from a Blaze reporter shows an unlocked computer in House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office, and Senator Merkley claims at least one laptop was taken from his office during the break-in. One bright spot, it's unlikely any classified data was stolen during the riot. Congressional computers don't have access to that kind of information outside of specialized rooms. For a lot of 
congressional staff. The information they deal with is unclassified, and a lot of it becomes public record anyway. And so it's, from that perspective, not particularly sensitive um, that it gets out. Still, exposed emails and documents could contain sensitive information, and the security breach offered bad actors the chance to plant bugs or other devices, meaning Congress will consider those areas of the Capitol as potentially compromised. Now, almost five months after that attack on the Capitol, the FBI has been able to make 450 arrests of Capitol rioters. I guess that's what happens when hundreds of people record and broadcast their crimes in mass. Who knew? Over the past year and over the past week especially, we've heard a lot about the killing of George Floyd, rightfully so. But one group often gets overlooked in the national debate around justice and policing. For our Datalog series, Newsy's Alex Travis shed some light on an undercovered story through some surprising numbers. Police brutality and race are at the center of some of the biggest conversations happening across the U.S. Marches and calls for justice over police-involved incidents involving black men. Protests across the country over videos showing the deaths of black men at the hands of police. So often, black men are vilified. But often left out of that conversation are black women, who, like black men, are killed by police at a disproportionately high rate. And we found that the highest profile police killings of black women in recent years only got about 8% of the coverage that killings of black men received. These numbers shed some light on how we still don't say her name. And they show that whether the victim is a man or a woman, the big factor in police violence is still race. My name is Katrina Johnson. I am the first cousin of Charlena Lyles. On June 18, 2017, um, my cousin called the police for help to report a burglary. And the dash cam video shows the officers. She was killed. She was shot seven times. At the, the most, she had a paring knife. And so even if that was the case, why was the result death? Victims of police violence like Charlena are real people with real stories. So take a minute. Which of these names do you recognize? These are all names of high profile victims of police violence. But through a Newsy Ipso survey, we found that some names are more recognizable than others. Overall, people are much less familiar with the victims on this list who are women. And most people say they haven't heard anything at all about the highest profile cases of black women killed by police, aside from Breonna Taylor. To understand why, we took a closer look at how these cases are covered. And to do that, we enlisted the help of Newsy data reporter, Rosie Chima. Hi, Rosie. Thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Hi, Alex. Yeah, thanks for including me. So yeah, we used the Say Her Name campaign and a report that they published in a big way to kind of look into their main focus of what kind of coverage are black female victims of police violence receiving. So we went through those five of the most trafficked news outlets um, and compared their coverage of black female victims post-Ferguson to nine very well-known male victims from that same time period. Yeah, and based on the number of articles that they appeared in, Breonna Taylor and Sandra Bland were by far the most well-known women on our list. Before this year, it was almost definitely Sandra Bland. She died in police custody in 2015, and we found almost 900 stories that mentioned her. But before this year, the most well-known male victim was Michael Brown, and there were 7,000 stories that mentioned him. That is a huge disparity. Also now the most well-known victim of police violence in the world, maybe of all time, is George Floyd. And his name appears in over 9,000 stories. And if we add up the 21 most well-known female victims in our data set, they appear in about 2,500 stories. And when you compare 9,000 to 2,500, that means that all of those female victims together 
got less than a third as much coverage than a single male victim. Research shows that if we look at gender and race together, Black women are the group who are most likely to be killed by police when unarmed of any group, including Black men. And that illuminates kind of how deeply entrenched perceptions of Black women as inherently dangerous, deranged, threatening, animalistic. And that impacts people when they are being, being police, in addition to how police officers see Black spaces. So I think there's this perception of who Black women are and the types of spaces that, um, that they reside in also are, are often criminalized. Police violence against Black women since the 1980s has gotten worse. Drugs are menacing our society. They're threatening our values and undercutting our institutions. They're killing our children. The folks that are largely impacted by those drug rates tend to be Black women and their children. I'm laying there screaming, asking somebody to help my granddaughter because he just shot her in the head. The case of Ayanna Stanley in Detroit, she was shot in the head by the Detroit police officers because of a raid. And this is what we see in the Breonna Taylor case, right? You see the police actually just going in kicking a door in and not asking any types of questions. Everybody there said they never heard the police identify themselves. And then the folks who are in that house are not expected to protect themselves. I was just wondering what it's been like for you and your family since Charlena was killed. To be perfectly honest, it has been an absolute nightmare. It's been three years and we don't even really know what happened, why it had to happen and what you could have done differently. How do you heal? How do you move on? How do you begin to pick up the pieces um, of your life knowing that it's already never gonna be the same? That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from Newsy are headed your way right now.